Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. You know, as always, I enjoy these uh, times that we gather like this because I enjoy talking about the Word of God. And we're about to go into Revelation chapter 13, which I believe is one of the most exciting of all the chapters in the book of Revelation. And I don't mean exciting because it's fun and entertaining. I mean exciting because the realization all the more is, I guess, revealed in that chapter about what the world is going to look like when we're in that period and things are going to happen, things are going to change in a way that we've all read about and heard about throughout the many years, the mark of the beast and all of those different things. And we're going to talk about that. And, and it is exciting. But it's sad for those, I believe, who are outside of the kingdom. So that's what I want to address today, those outside of the kingdom. But I'm talking to you, those who are inside of the kingdom. When we look at the book of Revelation, we realize it's the only book that predicts the future accurately. Well, not predict, it prophesies uh, about the future accurately. Every other book can make a guess or take a wild stab at it and hope they get it right. But Jesus is telling us this story and we realize and we know that everything that the Word of God teaches us, we believe. And the proof of our belief is that we've given our lives to Christ. We have banked our eternities on Him. We've decided that what this world has to offer and all that it's it supposedly we're supposed to enjoy the pleasures of life pleasures of sin even we've rejected those for a reason is because we believe god's word is true and it's eternal and so the book of revelation tells us about things that are going to happen and what i want to say to you today the believer is there is something we're supposed to do with this knowledge Yes, Revelation is exciting. Yes, it's the scriptures and we gain knowledge. But knowledge has a purpose. Knowledge brings about a certain amount of responsibility. You're responsible for what you know. And Jesus talked to the Pharisees once and he talked about their, um, the way they viewed the scriptures. In fact, in John chapter 5, let's read there. In John chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 39. Jesus is speaking. He says, you pour over the scriptures because you presume that by them you possess eternal life. These are the very words that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and to have life. In other words, Jesus is telling them there are motives and reasons for reading the scriptures. They were reading it thinking that knowledge would lead them to, I guess, the secrets of eternal life apart from God. Or maybe they had the wrong or they did have the wrong concept of God. And the scriptures, the very scriptures that they read were not helping them because their hearts were hard. So knowing the scriptures and reading them is it's good but with that goes responsibility and that's what I want to deal with today I want to talk about uh, or give a little bit of a review before we go into chapter 13 and look at what we've seen if you remember when we opened chapter 5 we saw Jesus in heaven I've said it many times you know the story but Jesus begins to open these scrolls and when he does havoc is released upon the earth because this is what is prophesied that is to come. Now Jesus said that in Revelation chapter 1, here's what he said about this book. He says, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon come to pass. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John who testifies to everything he saw this is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the whole purpose of the book is to reveal Jesus and to give his testimony about things that are about to happen. So as we read this, we are actually looking into the future. And what I want us to do is have a purpose for gaining this insight. If we look at all the horrors that we have, uh, or just go back and look back over them, all the things that we've read, out of the book of Revelation 
it should do something to us. It should stir up something in us. And one is evangelism. And I've said this before. We need to realize that we are the only people on planet Earth as believers who actually know accurately as much as God has revealed to us and much as he intends to reveal to us up to this date. We're the only people on planet Earth that knows what's going to happen. Now, that's a lot of knowledge, but it's a lot of responsibility that goes with it. We talked about after Jesus opens the scrolls, one of the things that happen is that these four horsemen are released. One is going to take peace from the earth. The other is going to bring about just death and mayhem, plagues, famines, pestilence. The economy is just going to go crazy. And the price of food, which we all need every day, is just going to shoot through the roof. And the currency of that time is going to be whether or not you have the mark of the beast. And so with this knowledge, I want us to just pause for a minute and say to ourselves that we're going to do something with this information. It's going to stir up within us the reality that Jesus is coming back. But also, there are two sets of people, or there are only two kinds of people on planet Earth. Those who are born again, saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, and those who are not. And so it's not a good person, bad person mentality. It's not a um, which denomination is better or which denomination is worse or which church is better or which other church is not so good. What's important is, is that a individual's name, especially you and your family, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which we're going to get to when we get into the later chapters. But looking from chapter 13 on up until chapter 19, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And we're about to go into an area where things are going to be horrible. But we've already studied about what happens when these trumpets begin to blow. The scrolls are open or the woes, the three woes that are pronounced on the earth. And we realize in chapter 12, as we closed last week, that Satan's access is going to be denied. In fact, he's going to be given the proverbial boot from heaven, never to return or never to be able to interact in that realm again as an accuser of the brothers. And so this is going to happen. But when it does, he's going to be uh, downcast to the earth and the earth is going to experience a magnitude of horror that it's never seen before. I want you to think about something with me because we're going to read Revelation 13, but I want you to think about something with me. Everything that we've read, uh, we see these concurrent events. We're working in a timeline about a three and a half year period. We've talked about it, the 42 months, the time, the times and half time. And we've talked about those numbers, 1260 days. All of that is a three, three and a half year period. And these things are going to start to happen in just rapid fire, concurrently. And I want you to think about 9-11 for a moment. When that happened, it happened and we experienced a lot of fear and trepidation. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And we were poised for uh, horror to follow. Because all of a sudden, our homeland had been breached. Someone had crossed over our borders, our boundaries of safety and protection, and they had done something that we had never seen before. But the good news for us in our generation and time is that it stopped. It wasn't concurrent, one event after the other, one horrifying moment after the other. The numbers of people dying uh, systematically and concurrently were not in the thousands as we've read about in the book of Revelation we're actually talking about billions dying on the face of the earth all within that short period of time period of time that we've talked about the three and a half years and so my point is, is simply this that I hope 
that we are stirred all the more with what we're reading. Jesus said those people, they study the scriptures and, you know, unless you're studying the scriptures and getting the right understanding, then you're just simply reading a book. But Jesus said these scriptures testify about me. So if they're not pointing you to Jesus, then what are they doing? See, they had other motives. Now, the book or the Bible is exciting. And the book of Revelation is exciting when you look at the events taking place. They're monumental. They're, they are almost explosive, if you will. And you could almost look at the book of Revelation like you're sitting in a movie theater watching a movie of events. And the good news, if you're watching a movie, it's not happening in reality. But these things are going to happen in reality. But what if after 9-11 occurred and the two towers came down, they were aiming at the White House or the Congressional uh, building in Washington, D.C., and perhaps even San Francisco or the Bay Area where we live? And what if immediately following that, a dam was exploded and hundreds if not thousands of homes were swept away in just a torrent of of water just released from this dam and thousands upon thousands of people people lost their lives right after 9-11 and then after that things start happening in the heavenlies the it the the sky is dark and it's dark for days and it seems like there's not going to be daylight again or we don't know when daylight is going to come the moon is blood red consistently but see that's not what happened 9-11 happened, we experienced the moment, and then we braced ourselves, and then we relaxed because it didn't get as bad as we thought it could. Well, in the book of Revelation, what we've been reading, these things are happening concurrently. They're happening in what we believe is a three and a half year period, and it's gonna be disaster upon disaster. And so let me read a scripture to you from the book of Ezekiel. Here is what I want you to think about. Uh, this is um, the Lord speaking to Ezekiel. And here's what he says in Ezekiel chapter three. And I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. Now, are we our brother's keeper? You know, I think we owe each other the knowledge that we have. I think at some point, everybody in your life that's near and dear to you or that comes in contact with you on a regular basis should know who you are as a Christian. They should know where you stand. They should be able to sense something unique or different about you. You're not a part of this world system anymore. Your language is different. Your actions, your attitudes, they're, they're different. Uh, the, the things that you do or the things that you don't do anymore should stand as a testimony or a witness to who you are. And when people squeeze the fruit, they like what they see in you but it also is a warning to them that whatever transformed your life, they also need. And so he says to in Ezekiel, I'm going to make you a watchman on the wall. Now, all of us, none of us are called, all of us are not called to the same office, I should say. And some are prophets, evangelists, teachers, and the various ministries that are biblically uh, outlined for us, especially in the book of Ephesians. But we are, like in 1 Corinthians, a member of the body of Christ. We're all members of the body of Christ. And so we have a responsibility to the body. But what the body does when it comes together is that it reaches out and begins to touch a dark world. That's why I ask you, and you've always been asked, to invite people to church. Not because we want to see numbers or just because we want to see numbers increase, but we believe that that is their opportunity to hear the gospel message that's going to change their lives. After all, it changed ours. And so we are people with a purpose. And 
Ezekiel is told something that I think is profound, and this is what God was going to hold him accountable to. Back to Ezekiel chapter 3, I'll start in verse 17 once again. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me, says the Lord. This warning is from me, says the Lord. And so you're not speaking your words. You're not selling yourself. You're telling people what thus saith the Lord. That's our purpose. That's our point. Yes, the book of Revelation is very exciting. It is one of the, I guess you could call it one of the fun books because it has, I don't know, Hollywood type drama. But I think far beyond that, is the fact that you are reading the future. Jesus said to John, I'm getting ready to show you things, everything that must take place after this. So we're looking at the future. No other book does that. And especially accurately, no other book does that. So when you read Revelation, when I read Revelation, we're looking at the future of what's going to happen to people that are in Christ, and what's going to happen to people that are outside of the kingdom of our Lord. So he says to Ezekiel, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not warn them or speak out of to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life. That wicked person will die. Their sin and I will hold him, they will die from their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. So in other words, I'm trying to read without my glasses today. So he's saying to them, to Ezekiel, that when I warn you of something, and you don't tell that person, when I warn them about their wickedness and they're gonna die from their sin, and you don't warn them, they're gonna die for their sin. But I'm going to hold you accountable for not telling them. Now, it's their responsibility to respond, but yours, Ezekiel, is to tell them. And so, in a sense, that's all of us to a varying degrees. Some of you, I mean, you guys work jobs, you do all kinds of different things, occupations, and, and we're in various fields of life, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Because you do your job and you do it to the best of your ability. Praise God. Now, those of us who are in the ministry, who are called to the ministry, yes, our calling is a little different. God holds us to a different standard of accountability. And it's a little scary sometimes. But um, he creates the environment, the Lord. Remember, Jesus said on this rock, I will build my church. In other words, it's his responsibility to build the church, he says. But I'm going to use you and I'm going to give you the message. So the Lord draws people into these environments called a church or the sanctuary of the living God. The Lord draws us to these places, sometimes because of chaos in our lives, sometimes because, you know, something good has happened or we remember the scriptures from our youth or something stirs up the thoughts of God in our hearts and in our minds and we show up at church or maybe it's Christmas or Easter and we want to dress up and go but people are drawn and so it becomes the minister's job to when God assembles them together is tell them what thus saith the Lord so our callings are different we do have different responsibilities and different accountabilities in the Word of God but we're studying the book of Revelation together, not to get that Hollywood drama from it, but to understand what's going to take place. And then once we do, we are at this place where we have to say, what are we going to do with this information? Knowledge alone, the Bible says, puffs up. The knowledge of God, what God wants us to do, is what's called the Great Commission. To go out and share His Word. So, yes, we're studying the book of Revelation, and I love it, and I'm excited about it. But it's not just for knowledge's sake. My hope is, is that you're doing something with it. 
that you're using what you hear. The cataclysmic events that are coming upon the world has stirred something in you that says, I need to tell somebody. I need to tell somebody. I really need to do that. And so he continues speaking. The Lord continues to speak to Ezekiel. He says, in the next verse, he says, but if you do not warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sins, but you will have saved yourself. In other words, if you warn them, maybe I should put on my glasses. If you warn them, when you do, you have done your job and they refuse to turn. You've done what you're supposed to do. That is our task. That's the reason that I like doing Sunday school and Bible study. Plus, I mean, the, the great prize for us as individuals is that our souls are saved. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is the great uh, reward. Our souls are saved. We have settled our eternal, we've settled our eternal destinies in Christ. And so we're secure. We're secure. If we believe the word of God that those who have the spirit of God belong to God and those do not do not belong to God. And you know, and the spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, then you know that your eternity is secure. This body will die, but this soul of ours is eternal. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago in our Sunday services. Your soul is eternal, but so is the soul of your neighbor. So is the soul of your loved one. They are eternal. And so the Lord continues to talk to Ezekiel. Again, when a righteous person's person turns from their righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before them, they will die. Since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that that person did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin, and they do not sin, they will surely live because they took warning, and you will have saved yourself. Now, we know this. We know that he's not saying that a person has righteousness apart from God by doing righteous deeds, simply being good or doing good things from time to time. What he's really talking about is warning them by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If a brother or sister is caught up in a sin, you who are spiritual, go and restore them. But be careful lest you also be tempted. Um, when we are at odd with a brother, you know what? Leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with them and then come back. So there is this responsibility that we bear as believers. And there are these things that God has called us to. Now, every individual is accountable for their own soul. The Bible teaches us to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. So that's what we that's what we're doing making sure our salvation is secure, but we're also trying to bring as many as we can into the kingdom. And what is it that draws a person to the Lord? The Holy Spirit, yes, but his word. When they are working together, the word of God and the spirit of God, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. A move of God's spirit according to his word. Now, what comes to mind might be a revival. You know, this grand revival where tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe perhaps millions are being saved. But there's a revival that I believe can take place between you and a friend. You and your family. Yes, revival means revived or to be made alive. And it's by the word of God and the moving of God's spirit and the acceptance 
in the heart that Jesus Christ is Lord that changes everything. So he's telling Ezekiel, you have a responsibility. And I'm saying to us as a body of believers, we have a responsibility to share the knowledge that we're learning. We're not just studying the Bible just to know stuff. We're actually learning with a purpose. And that is to use the knowledge of God's word, to speak it, to live it in hopes that it will transform someone's life. Being ready to give any person an answer who asks you, what is the reason for the hope that you have in Christ? Now, I know we're not reading the book of Revelation right now. This sounds like a different Revelation teaching. And it is a little bit because what I want to do is to remind us why. We're studying it and then what we're supposed to do with the knowledge we have. Because think about it. None of us can change the past. We cannot impact the past. It's happened. But as I said earlier, the book of Revelation is the only book that can accurately tell you what's going to happen in the future. And that's what it's doing. Everything we read after chapter four is to talk about what's going to take place. And so we're actually reading into the future. And if you read far enough in the book, you realize that Jesus is coming back. And if you read far enough, you realize that there is something called a great white throne judgment. And if you read far enough, you'll realize there is a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if there is such a book, then the next question, the next logical question is, is your name written in it? If it is, praise God. But then also, once that's understood or established, what happens next? Who's around you that you know, love, or in your life, or that you associate with, or you're around often? Is their name? written in that book. Yes, I don't want the book of Revelation to be simply a book of excitement or just uh, Hollywood type drama, as I said earlier. I read to you last week in Revelation 12, Satan is going to be hurled to the earth and his time is going to be very short and he knows it. And we realize that there are believing people on the planet. There are those who are with the woman who's going to be protected for that 1260 day period. But we also know that there are those that are going to be very vulnerable, exposed, available to the beast, the antichrist, Satan, his false prophet and all of that. They're going to be within reach. And Satan's going to go after them to annihilate them. And think about the pressure that some are facing right now on their jobs to take the vaccine. There are people right now, and I know this because I write letters. I've written a letter. And by the way, any of you who may need it, I wrote a letter that talks about our constitutional rights and our biblical beliefs as to why we believe if we choose not to, we don't have to take the vaccine. One purpose or one of the main reasons when we look at the Constitution is you have rights. As an American citizen, you have rights. And as a Christian, we have the word of God to stand on. We believe our body is the temple of the living God. Therefore, if it is and we belong to Christ, then we have the opportunity, I believe, as Christians to say no to something that we believe violates our biblical beliefs or principles on which we stand. So I wrote a letter and many people have come to get this letter to take it to their job. In fact, I just sent a picture of my uh, four square denomination ordination license to a, a lady in our church so that she can show it to the place, and you know this place if I were to say it to you, 
She has to show them my license to prove that a let, the letter that I wrote came from a real church, a real pastor, a real denomination, a real belief system. The pressure on her and many is great because it may cost them their job. And they're looking at that and they're dealing with that with great concern. Yes, with great concern, they're worried about even their jobs, their livelihoods that they've worked for, they've studied, they've gone to institutions of higher learning to get degrees to work in the occupation field of their choosing. And now someone is saying, if you don't do what we want you to do for reasons that we think, and who knows how valid their belief is in the vaccine. Now, I'm not here to tell you to take it or not to take it. I'm just simply saying right now in America, we're being faced with what I believe is a constitutional crisis that tells people they have to do something that they believe that their rights are protected from. Now, this is a vaccine. Now let's move things forward. Now we're talking about whether or not you can buy and sell, whether or not you can uh, obtain sustenance food for yourself and your family. And the only way in this period that we're about to read about it that you can is if you carry this mark, this identifying mark. So I think we are very close, very close to a time where things are going to change right before our eyes. Remember, as I said on Sunday, Christians are being killed, persecuted around the world. And just so you know, there is no massive outcry. Nobody's saying, oh, those Christians, we have to stand up for them. Nobody's saying that. Well, I won't say nobody. Christian organizations and, and groups and churches like ours who contribute or donate to uh, ministries and support groups that help Christians around the world. By the way, I need to remind you again that you are a part, when you are a tithing member of Faith Fellowship Foursquare Church, you are a part of a missions uh, ministry that goes on around the world. Just so you know, I love to remind you of that so that you know we're not just trying to collect money for the sake of collecting money. We do things with it. We do things with it. Do things that build the kingdom of God and support God's people, but also outreach to reach those who are in a dark place or those who need to hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, Satan is released upon the earth in we as we read in Revelation chapter 12 and his fury is hot and he's about to go after people with vehemence with passion with wickedness and vileness on a level the world has not seen before Jesus even talked about it in Matthew's gospel when he says unless those days were shortened even the elect or many would be turned away even from the gospel because the pressure is going to be great. And so, yes, the book of Revelation is exciting, it's dynamic, it's powerful, it's, it's instructional, it's a, a joy to read in some ways, and then it touches the soul in ways that brings about, or should bring about a certain amount of compassion and passion for the souls of people in our lives and those around us. So next week, we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 13. I felt like I needed to give you this preview or reminder while we're in the middle of the book of why we're studying it so that we can have an impact on our world with the knowledge that we receive from the Word of God and specifically the book of Revelation. God bless you. May He keep you. Until next time, God bless.